So it's uh, my great, great pleasure to have today uh, Nedan Leaf here to us talking about three body problem and chaos. So Nedan is uh, uh, a great uh, scientist and a great person and I'm very lucky to have collaborated with Nedan on many papers. So it's one of my best collaborators indeed. So Nathan uh, got his PhD in his hometown at McMaster University. And then he moved for a couple of years as um, he's a fellow to the Netherlands. And then he moved as a Canadian National Fellow with a Canadian National Fellowship to the American Museum of Natural History, where he got also a, a Cadflash Fellowship. And then after that, he got a um, permanent position as uh, associate professor at University of Concepcion in, C in Chile. And uh, yeah, give us a great talk. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Giacomo. Um, thanks for the invite. As always, it's a pleasure to see you and to interact with you. Um, so I'm Nathan Lee. I'm an associate faculty at the Universidad de Concepcion and a research affiliate at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, today, I'll be talking about chaos in the gravitational three-body problem and constructing a factory to predict merger rates of black hole pairs. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to thank my collaborators. So the first half of the talk is work done by undergraduate students working at the Universidad de Concepcion with myself and my collaborator, Alessandro Trani, whose heroic efforts in gravity integrator tsunami made it all possible. Uh, and the second half was done working with Nick Stone and Jeremy Webb. And I'd like to thank Nick Stone and his great skills with diffusion-based problems and his considerable mathematical prowess, as well as Jeremy Webb and his great expertise with running numerical simulations of star cluster evolution and actually getting it right, which is non-trivial. So like all good problems, let's start at the beginning and formally define the general three-body problem. Uh, so the three-body problem states, Given the positions, velocities, and masses of all three particles at time t equals zero, predict the positions and velocities of all three particles at any future time. And this is a solved problem for the two-body problem, thanks to Newton and Kepler, but the three-body problem remains unsolved despite a rich and interesting history over the last 400 years or so. And the reason for this is chaos. And it was Poincaré who eventually showed that a general analytic solution could never be found because of this. And he was awarded a prize for it by the King of, the, by the King of Sweden, Oscar II, who at the time had issued a challenge to physicists to solve the problem. So thanks to Poincaré, we know that the general three-body problem is a fundamental example of chaos in nature. Uh, okay, oh, there we go. Uh, so first, let's briefly touch upon the astrophysical motivation for the work I'll be talking about today. I'll try to go through this quickly since I know this group doesn't need too much of a primer in this area. Uh, but one of the primary interests in the three problem today is for making gravitationally bound pairs of black holes called black hole black hole binaries that later merge and are detected via their gravitational wave emission. So how does the dynamical channel work for putting black holes into binaries? Well, the upper left inset shows a typical star cluster in our galaxy, 47 Tuck. The stellar densities in these clusters can be so high that direct collisions occur between objects about once every million years or so. And the inset to the lower right shows just such a collision event and how the dynamical channel works. And this is a depiction of a single binary exchange interaction. So what we see is the original binary labeled with objects one and two comes in from the left. The original interloping single star labeled object three comes in from the right. Um, a chaotic gravitationally bound three body interaction ensues mediated entirely by Newtonian gravity. And the interaction ends with particle two being ejected leaving particles one and three in a binary. So it's an exchange interaction because particle two was exchanged out of the binary and particle three was exchanged into the binary. So we can imagine zooming in on the core of a star cluster like 47 Tuck here where the densities are very high and finding a particular black hole and following it as it orbits throughout the cluster. And if we do this, it's only a matter of time before the black hole encounters a binary star system 
and a chaotic gravitationally bound three body interaction ensues. And the way these interactions tend to unfold is they continually break apart into hierarchies with a temporary single star going on a prolonged excursion as shown here, temporary single star is here, leaving behind a temporary binary star system. And so the system continually breaks apart into this hierarchy with the temporary single sometimes going on prolonged excursions and sometimes going on very short lived excursions. But if the particles are all point particles such that collisions are not possible, then the interaction inevitably ends with the ejection of one particle to spatial infinity, leaving the other two particles bound in a binary. And importantly, it's usually the least massive object that is ejected from these interactions. And since black holes tend to be the most massive objects in star clusters, there goes the least massive object right there. Uh, these interactions tend to systematically exchange black holes into binaries. And so now we're left with a black hole star binary. And we can imagine that it's only a matter of time before it encounters another black hole, another chaotic three body interaction exchange interaction ensues. And we're left with two black holes in a binary that can later merge due to gravitational wave emission. And so this is how the dynamical channel works for putting black holes into binaries. Uh, but I mentioned that the general three body problem is an example of chaos in nature, but what defines chaos? So if a system is inherently chaotic, then small perturbations to the initial state or configuration can compound over time and cause significant deviations in the outcome from realization to realization. This is often called the butterfly effect and is depicted here for the chaotic three body problem. So what the authors do in this study, so on the x-axis, we have a dimensionless unit of time. On the y-axis, we can think of this as the distance of each particle from the system center of mass. The articles start with three particles at some distance from the center of mass, a blue particle, a green particle, and a red particle. At time t equals zero, they release the particles from rest and they follow their trajectories through phase space. The authors perform many simulations, each time perturbing the initial po positions of the particles just slightly. And what we see is that initially the trajectories of the particles through phase space overlap quite well, but over sufficiently long time scales, these small perturbations can compound and cause a different outcome. And so we could use a macroscopic measure of the outcome of these interactions and one example would just be which of the three particles is the one ejected. And so we see that the small perturbations can compound over time and cause a different particle to be the one ejected at the end. Sometimes it's the red particle, sometimes it's the green particle, sometimes it's the blue particle. So the takeaway here is that chaotic systems are ones that for very nearly identical sets of initial conditions, the solution diverges over time. And so I'd like to think specifically about a scattering experiment again, uh, so we can see how such a well-defined but perturbed initial set of conditions in the chaotic three-body problem will evolve dynamically to produce a unique set of end states. And for this, you first need two quick definitions shown here. So the first is the binary phase, which ranges from zero to two pi or zero to 360 degrees and just tells you where in the orbits the objects are. The second is the inclination angle between the incoming velocity vector of the single and the orbital plane of the binary. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run many millions of computer simulations varying this initial setup slightly each time. And if we do this, we can make what is called a phase space plot as shown here which is designed to reveal the chaotic and deterministic regions of the parameter space. And so on the x-axis, we have the initial binary phase from zero to 360 degrees. On the y-axis, we have the inclination angle from zero to 180 degrees. And we sample our parameter space uniformly within this grid. Uh, so each data point in this plot represents the outcome of a unique set of initial conditions for a single simulation color-coded by which of the three particles is ejected. 
right? So we pick some initial binary phase and inclination. We run the simulation. Once it's done, we record which of the three particles is the one ejected. And we put a point down on the plot color coded by which of the particles was ejected. And what we find is we see these uniform swaths of color, mostly shown in green and blue here, which indicate simulations that finished very quickly in only a few dynamical times. And we call, we call these islands of regularity uh, since the outcome of the interaction is typically the same in each island, modified slightly in terms of the outcome properties, such as the ejection velocity and direction of the single star and the leftover orbital properties of the binary star system. But the important thing is, in these islands, they represent deterministic outcomes of the three-body problem and no chaos is present. Where we see chaos is in the regions of the parameter space with this multicolored, with this, uh, with the multicolored um, um, regions um, without uniform coloring, since changing the initial conditions even slightly can cause a different particle to be ejected at the end. So we see for any combination of binary phase and inclination initially, we can choose a very close neighboring combination and the probability that a different particle is ejected is very, very high. And so these are the, the, the multicolored regions correspond to the chaotic regions of phase space. Okay, so I'd like to look at a specific but interesting example, um, namely chaos in the vicinity of a singularity in the three body problem. And so one can imagine setting up a perfect equilateral triangle where at the vertex of each triangle, you place a particle and all particles have the same mass. And if you release all three particles from rest at the same time, then they will coincide at the origin in both space and time. And you will have a singularity in the Newtonian acceleration, which blows up since formerly the relative distances between the particles drop to zero. And you can imagine by perturbing the triangles initially, so they are not perfectly equilateral, we're perturbing the system initially right in the vicinity of the singularity. So all the three particles arrive at the system center of mass at nearly the same time, but slightly offset. And so the experiment that we perform is to perturb the triangle and try to study chaos near the singularity, hopefully trying to take it all the way down to the Planck scale and make perhaps a comment about quantum gravity. And so the way that we set up the experiment is we center these circles on the um, um, centered on the, the, the vertex of a perfect equilateral triangle. And for each realization or simulation, what we do is we sample the position of a new vertex uniformly within this circle. And we do this for each all three particles. We then reconstruct the triangle and recompute the lengths of the sides, where S1 is the length of the side opposing particle one. S2 is the length of the side opposing particle two, and so on. <clears throat> and so we do many realizations of this. We perform in total 10 million simulations, perturbing the triangles. Um, um, for each realization is one perturbed triangle. And uh, we then make phase space plots for this. And just to show you exactly what this is looking like. So Ugo Parashewski, who's the one who's been leading this project and doing excellent work. This is basically how the sampling works. And so you construct a series of triangles. Some are very deformed, some are less deformed and you release them from rest at time t equals zero and record which of the three particles is the one that is ejected. Okay, and so then we can make phase space plots uh, for the equilateral triangle experiment. And so on the x-axis, we have the ratio of the lengths of two sides of our triangle. And on the y-axis, we have the lengths of the sides of the two other sides of our triangle. And so the singularity in this parameter space corresponds to one, one, which is the perfect equilateral triangle. And Ugo has actually included these boxes, which show zoom-ins of particular regions, just so that you can see uh, interspersed within this sea of chaos, we do see these deterministic structures appearing all over the place. Um, and generally what we find here 
is in the vicinity of the singularity, we see a lot of deterministic regions where the same particle is always ejected. Uh, but we also see chaotic regions as we move away from the singular region. And so, for example, we can look at this region right here, which corresponds to very deformed triangles. And so here we're moving back into the regime of binary single scattering, where our triangles are so deformed that the length of one side is very small and the lengths of the other two sides are very large. And so we can zoom in on this region of the parameter space to see what's going on. And this is what we find. Uh, so we see these deterministic structures interspersed with a sea of chaos. And so we seem to see a fractal distribution with the islands of determinism repeating at regular intervals, seemingly down to infinitely small scales. And so the question we'd like to now ask is, what is this telling us about quantum gravity if we try to extrapolate down to the Planck length? And so just looking at this naively, um, the preliminary results might suggest that gravity remains deterministic and chaotic below the Planck scale, uh, if this does indeed continue indefinitely. And it would be an interesting statement to make since quantum mechanics suggests it should be a fully probabilistic problem at very small scales. But these naive results suggest that this may not be the case, at least for gravity. However, it's a very difficult problem to, to tackle both computationally and theoretically. And as you move down into this region, this is where quantum mechanical effects and general relativistic effects are going to become more and more important. So the next step is to reperform these experiments with general relativistic, um, with general relativ general rel general relativity and post Newtonian corrections turned on. And what we're going to find is that these triangles are so deformed that two particles end up so close together initially that they merge instantaneously. And so if we were to plot black points for points that where the, the initial two, two objects merge almost immediately, we're basically going to lose all of our resolution going down into this singular region. And so what, if anything, we can say about trying to extrapolate down uh, is going to be a bit of a challenge, but it's a work in progress. And um, we'll see what we can say. Uh, we can also look, uh, return to the singular region and try zooming in on that. And so again, um, the perfect equilateral triangle corresponds to one, one. And again, we see our deterministic swaths interspersed with what appear to be chaotic zones. And so each of these zoom ins going from top to bottom is zooming in more and more on the singular region. And what we see is as we start to zoom in, we see these deterministic plumes start to appear in between the islands of determinism. And as we zoom in more, they become more prominent and we're losing our chaotic subset of interactions. And you zoom in once more and the problem appears to be fully deterministic. And so again, it would be great to try to make a statement about going all the way down to the Planck scale and saying something like at infinitely small scales, the problem is fully deterministic. But again, when you turn on general relativistic effects and post Newtonian corrections, it's basically going to give us a big circle right here, washing out our resolution right where we need it in the vicinity of the singularity. Um, so um, how moving forward, what to say about this um, and moving down to the, the quantum gravity scale. We might not be able to say much, but we're learning a lot about chaos and um, exactly how you bridge between these singular regions into the, um, the scattering regime and the differences in the distributions of the properties of the binaries that you form. So for example, you can imagine in this case, uh, this, this could be applicable to um, making binaries via three single stars coming together and ejecting one particle at a high kinetic energy, leaving the other two particles bound. And so the distributions we get will tell us the properties we expect for binaries formed via three body interactions of isolated single stars in dense environments. Um, so now we can ask what happens if we set our triangle rotating and balance these centripetal and gravitational forces? 
And so this is the high angular momentum equivalent of the previous experiment, which was obviously the low angular momentum limit. And the singularity in this case is now only in time, since it should take an infinite amount of time for all three particles to fall in for a perfect equilateral triangle. So we do the exact same experiment as before, with the only difference now being that each particle has a non-zero initial tangential velocity that was decided to perfectly balance the outward centripetal force with the inward gravitational force. And so we do the same experiment as before and make our phase space plots and we get what is shown here. So there's been a coordinate transformation and now our, singular, our, our singularity corresponds to zero, zero in this parameter space. Um, but what we appear to be seeing is more chaos in the rotating case, but why this should be is a mystery. We still see deterministic swaths as indicated by these fine spirals. Um, but between the spirals, it looks like chaos is emerging. And so, so this, is, uh, this, this will get across the, the subtlety of, making, of, of the difficulty in actually making these plots. So you could imagine applying a transformation to this plot where we remove the rotation and we could ask, would we recover this low angular momentum case? And if so, where is this chaos coming from? So you can imagine just taking this picture and rotating it, right? Within these deterministic regions, there should be no chaos. So rotating it and suddenly seeing these regions break into these fine spirals with chaos separating them is something that we, were, we are not expecting and actually don't think to be real. Well, um, and so you see that the the, like the blue region, for example, gets rotated into spirals that are grouped close together initially and then get farther apart as the rotation continues. And poor Gustavo here, um, who's, who's leading this project and doing a great job, is probably going to have to go up to about a billion simulations, whereas, whereas Ugo and his low angular momentum limit is able to do it with only 10 million simulations. And the reason we're going to need so many more simulations is to resolve some of these really fine detailed structures. And as we do so, I think what we'll see is you can see these blues, the blue swaths will start to appear um, more and more. And basically regions that look chaotic will, will, will disappear and look more deterministic, I think. Um, and so again, um, Trying to say something and extrapolating um, is, is, is difficult at this point. Right now, what we really need to see is an improved phase space plot so we can get a sense of how much of the parameter space is really chaotic and how much is deterministic. And so it's, it's really, it can be a real subtlety in making these plots and making them, making the deterministic structures pop out properly. Uh, so just to summarize so far, uh, phase space plots are great for revealing structure in the initial conditions and where chaos will appear. Uh, the deterministic regions tend to have analytic solutions where the chaotic regions do not. And so this points us to the need to develop a probabilistic theory to perform the required predictions in chaotic regions of phase space, in addition to the need to perform many millions of computer simulations to actually test the theory. And so um, this might be a good, good point to take questions because um, now I was just going to talk about how we go about developing the probabilistic theory for chaotic regions of phase space. So we know we need a uh, probabilistic theory for chaotic regions of phase space, but how do we go to, about developing this? Well, for this, we invoke the density of states formalism. So what is the density of states formalism and why is it so useful? Well, it gives the probability of obtaining any given outcome for a well-defined set of initial conditions. So for the three-body problem, it's an 18-dimensional phase volume describing the outcomes of a series of three-body simulations with the same total energy, angular momentum, and particle masses. And so this density of states expression here um, it's defining a phase volume, and you can imagine without these delta functions, um, we're left with, for each of our three particles, three positions and three momenta, and formally they would integrate from zero to infinity, so we would have an infinite phase volume. 
But by including these delta functions, we ensure that the integral is only non-zero when energy and angular momentum conservation are upheld. And in previous works, um, authors were only able to accommodate the ener energy conservation. And this is the first time we've been able to do it purely from first principles by including the angular momentum dependence right from the beginning. And so Stone and Lee 2019 provides a first principles solution. Um, whereas in Valtonin and Cartoonin, for example, they handled the angular momentum dependence um, um, by normalizing by a numerical scattering experiment. So this is all coming from first principles. Um, and so what these delta functions do is they, effect they effectively reshape the boundaries of your phase space volume. Okay, and the key assumption needed to apply the formalism is that ergodicity, which is really just another word for chaos, is upheld in an ensemble of three body interactions and so the total accessible phase space volume is populated uniformly. So once you simplify this equation and get the boundaries of your phase space volume, you know that within that phase space volume, it is to be sampled uniformly. Um, to become ergodic or chaotic, the system generally needs to enter a state of near equipartition at least twice. And if this occurs, the system loses all memory of its initial state or configuration and the interaction is then a chaotic one since the particles do not remember where they came from in the initial parameter space. They only remember the total interaction energy, angular momentum, uh, and the particle masses. And so how do we solve or simplify this equation? Uh, well, for example, we can first shift to center of mass coordinates, which immediately reduces the expression to an integral over only 12 dimensions. And using other tricks, we were able to reduce it to a trivariate distribution joint in the orbital energy of the leftover binary, the orbital eccentricity, and the cosine of the inclination angle between the ejection, the, the, velo the velocity vector of the ejected single and the orbital plane of the binary. And what you can then do is you can marginalize over any two parameters and obtain the predicted distribution of, for example, binary orbital energies. And this gives the probability of the interaction yielding a binary of any given orbital energy. And so what the method allows us to do effectively is to take a well-defined initial set of conditions as shown on the left and map it to a distribution of outcomes shown on the right, purely analytically. And so because we included this, the, the delta function and angular momentum right from the beginning, it's, it's all done from first principles and predicts all of the relevant distribution functions for any combination of energy and angular momentum. So you get the distributions of orbital energy for the surviving binary, the distributions of escaper velocities, um, and so on. And so we can do briefly look at a comparison between um, our analytic model to see how well it reproduces the simulated data. So we show here the distributions of final binary orbital energies as a function of the post interaction orbital energy, uh, the post interaction binary orbital energy normalized by the total interaction energy. And this function is what we get from Stone and Lee 2019. And it just gives the probability of obtaining a binary in any bin in orbital energy post interaction. And so the solid lines show the simulation results, the dashed lines show the analytic predictions, and the color coding indicates different initial binary orbital eccentricities, which changes the total interaction angular momentum. We see great agreement between um, our numerical spare experiments and our analytic predictions and find important differences related to previous results. So the black dashed line shows the classic Hagee result, which assumes detailed balance between binary creation and destruction. And so we find slightly steeper power law indices in the classic Hege result. Um, which suggests that real ensembles of three body systems are slightly out of detail balance. But what's even more interesting is the final distribution of binary orbital eccentricities we obtain post interaction shown on the X axis. And this is because we find suprathermal eccentricity distributions in the limit of low angular momentum. 
And so the classic result, the Hege, the 1975 Hege result, which just shows a thermal eccentricity distribution is shown by the black dashed line. And if you focus on the green and yellow curves, which are the low angular momentum limit, you'll notice that both the simulations and the analytic theory predict suprathermal eccentricity distributions in this limit. And so our formalism predicts more eccentric black hole black hole binaries from the dynamical formation channel than previously predicted, at least potentially, uh, which could contribute to enhancing the rates of black hole black hole binary mergers due to gravitational wave emission. But the takeaway message is that with this new probabilistic theory, simulations of the general three body problem do not need to be performed since we know the probabilities for any given outcome. So let me ask you, uh, when it comes to computational simulations of three-body systems, how do you know if your final solution is correct? Uh, well, if the system is very sensitive to the initial conditions, then you require computations that have very high precision and accuracy. Uh, but errors are inevitable for computers and accumulate as the simulations go on. Why is this an issue? Because computational errors can mimic minute perturbations, and cause the solutions to diverge for very similar sets of initial conditions. So errors effectively mimic chaos. So how do you know when the divergence is due to chaos and how do you know when it's due to numerical errors? And this is an ongoing area of research and typically there is no simple answer. Uh, we could talk about this at length and, and concepts like regularization and handling singularities in the M-body problem. Um, so please feel free to ask uh, later. But why should you care? Well, consider wanting to perform a computer simulation of an astrophysical object or system that is actually observable, such as a star cluster, as an example is shown here. And your goal is to perform a simulation that reproduces exactly what we observe today. But the objects are always very old when compared to human lifetimes. So your simulations must start 10 billion years ago. What do you assume for the initial conditions? Well, it's often a challenging decision to make, especially if your simulations are so expensive, you can only run one in a time period of order a year. And this is the case for n-body simulations of dense star cluster evolution. The allowed initial parameter space is also unfathomably large and the initial conditions are poorly constrained. So this approach would require thousands, millions, or even billions of simulations. So the combination of needing great accuracy and precision expensive numerical simulations that take a long time to run and not knowing the initial conditions makes this an impractical way to study the problem. So in short, we need new theoretical tools in order to properly tackle this monumental research goal. And so this brings me to the tool that I wanted to talk about today. And in particular, we wish to answer the question, how do single binary scatterings as occur in dense star clusters modify the distributions of binary properties over time? And do they make a big difference to black hole black hole merger rates this? So we can consider a population of binary stars all orbiting within a star cluster. And given the initial distributions of binary orbital parameters and the host cluster properties, we can derive a diffusion equation to evolve the binary population forward through time due to dynamical interactions with single and binary stars. And so this is analogous to a population of binaries in a thermal bath with heat being transferred from the binaries to the singles via single binary interactions, providing a heat source in the process. And I've just written a very simple diffusion-based equation to convey the general concepts. We balance the rate at which binaries populate the different bins in, for example, or orbital energy. Binaries flow into each bin and out of each bin due to single binary scatterings. And the critical ingredient that is needed is this function right here, which is what we get from Stone and Lee 2019, since it provides the outcome distributions for three body scatterings. So the first step in the project was to actually derive these distribution functions uh, for the outcome distributions for chaotic regions of phase space, such that we no longer need to perform simulations of three body interactions. We now have an analytic function describing the outcome probabilities to work with and can build a completely analytic diffusion based model. 
And this model is potentially, um, so this, the, the technique is independent of computational methods uh, to understand the dominant physics evolving populations, binary populations and dense stellar systems. And this could be a game changer for the problem since it's very difficult to tackle with computers um, since at least in n-body codes, the addition of binaries makes the computations prohibitively expensive. Because our method is analytic, we can sweep through the parameter space of initial conditions with minimal computational expense. <clears throat> and so with our probability density functions now derived, we're ready to move on to the next step, which is to evolve an entire population of binaries due to single binary scatterings. What we really want is a more sophisticated diffusion equation that goes beyond first order, but the idea remains the same. We balance the rate at which binaries populate the different bins in orbital energy. Binaries flow into each bin and out of each bin due to single binary scatterings. Uh, we integrate into our model a Fokker-Planck formalism and couple the single binary interaction evolution to that of the host cluster. And as before, in order to calculate our diffusion coefficients, what we needed is our probability density function from Stone and Lee 2019 to build the model. Uh, whoops. So before showing the results of our method, I'd like to briefly motivate it by discussing what the goals are and what we hope to obtain from it. So what can we do with our analytic model? Um, one thing we can do with our formalism is to predict rates for black hole black hole mergers in dense stellar environments due to the dynamical formation channel. Uh, so we get population statistics for a wide set of initial cluster conditions for comparison to observational data. And this is important since we're very clueless about the initial conditions and for example, how many stars, black holes, neutron stars, and, and so on should be in a given cluster. Because the method is analytic, we can rapidly sweep through the parameter space of initial conditions and isolate the influence of three and four body dynamics in deciding the overall merger rates coming from this channel. And currently no model for star cluster evolution can cover the entire parameter space relevant to real star clusters. So ours is the first method that can do so while also including physical effects that other methods um, may have trouble capturing realistically. We can also predict the rates of formation of various types of stellar exotica where either collisions are required or the exchange of a compact remnant into a binary system is needed, such as the formation of low mass X-ray binaries or millisecond pulsars, collisions between main sequence stars and blue straggler formation, and so on. And this is important since the numbers and properties of exotic binary systems should ultimately correlate with black hole black hole merger rates. All right, so let's look at what happens when we solve our diffusion equation and evolve the distribution of binary orbital energies forward through time due to single binary scatterings. We're gonna begin with the picture shown on the left, um, which is a one zone model, where we assume that everything happening in the core um, stays in the core. So there is no flow of binaries into or out of the cluster core. And this can happen because when three body interactions end, a single is ejected and the binary gets a recoil kick decided by linear momentum conservation and it can be enough to push it out of the core. And so this simple model can be improved upon by going to a two zone model where we do allow for binaries to flow into and out of the cluster core. So let's start with our one zone model and look at the results of integrating analytically over our diffusion equation for a period of hundred relaxation times shown at different times via the colored dashed lines. And so on the x-axis, we have the final post-energy binary orbital energy normalized by the total interaction energy. And the y-axis shows the fraction of binaries in each bin in orbital energy. The black line shows our assumed initial distributions of binary orbital energies given by Upic's law. And this is just an analytic power law distribution motivated by observations of young binary populations thought to be unmodified by dynamics. And so first I'll point, this is the end corresponding to wide binaries. This is the end corresponding to compact binaries. And so our initial distribution prefers wide binaries, but the characteristic evolution over time is such that these single binary interactions tend to push the wide binaries to more compact states. And the reason is simply because um, in these interactions, 
additional kinetic energy tends to, on average, be imparted to the interloping single. And so um, it, the singles leave with more positive energy than they came in with, leaving the binaries more compact. We also see our binary population being depleted. At the wide end, we include a sink term in our diffusion equation. So if a binary drifts beyond this limit, we assume it's rapidly destroyed due in the subsequent single binary interaction. And if it drifts beyond this limit, we remove it from the population because we assume it's so compact it will merge due to gravitational wave emission before the next single binary interaction occurs. And we can compare uh, the results of our model to n-body simulations of star cluster evolution to see how well our analytic model reproduces simulated data. And so the colored points show the results from our n-body simulations, whereas the dashed lines show our solution from the diffusion equation. We follow the time evolution of the binary orbital energy distribution function shown on the y-axis. And what we see is we see good agreement between the model and the analytic prediction, between the analytic predictions and the simulations at the wide and compact ends. But in the intermediate regime, we seem to be, the simulations are under predicting our analytic predictions by of order of factor of two. So let's see how this can be improved upon by going to our two zone model where we allow for binaries to flow into and out of the cluster core. So just to remind you, binaries can get a recoil kick that causes them to leave the core, but binaries also tend to be the, the, some of the most massive objects in clusters. So via energy echopartition, they give up kinetic energy to singles and slow down and sink deeper in the cluster potential. And so we include a sink term for when binaries are kicked out of the core and a source term for when they flow back in due to mass segregation or energy echopartition. Um, and so let's look at the time evolution for our two zone model. So the population in the core is shown in blue, the population in the halo is shown in red, and we assume 50% binaries in both, in both the core and the halo. And what we see as we let it evolve is that the core population tends to evolve faster because of higher densities, both in terms of losing the initial population to the halo and also draining into the hard south boundary beyond which the binaries are destroyed or ionized. And so the takeaway message here is that by playing around with our boundary conditions, which are decided via sink and source terms in our Boltzmann formalism, we can improve the agreement between um, simulations and our theory quite a bit. The parameter space is huge though, and which terms are important will change with the properties of the host cluster. Uh, so the next step is to understand how and when these correction factors should be implemented for the entire parameter space relevant to observed star clusters. And I am, I am almost finished here, but I will show you very briefly um, that the agreement is indeed improved. Um, so we can look at a comparison between the simulations and our analytic theory for just the core and the halo separately. And I'll show those two populations separately in just a second, uh, but just to briefly introduce the plot. So the colors show binary energy distributions at time T equals zero in black, after 12 core relaxation times in blue, and after 100 core relaxation times in green. The solid lines and solid dots show halo binaries, whereas the dashed lines and open dots show core binaries. And so let's look at the core first. Well, Nathan, can you wrap up in a couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah, I'm all on. This is this is this is it. Um, so this is the results for just the core. Uh, we find that the analytic, um, the model, and the simulations agree very well, typically to within one standard deviation or less. The error bars are huge. And this is because there are typically of order 20 to 50 binaries in the core and more like 150 to 200 in the halo at any given time. So if we look at the halo, we see reduced error bars and we still see good agreement between um, the model and the simulations typically agreeing to within one standard deviation or less. Um, so by adding additional sink and source terms, we are indeed able to significantly improve the agreement with numerical simulations a lot. And we could have kept going. Um, and so just to wrap up, 
Um, I think I said most of this, um, what we can do with our analytic model, population statistics for a wide set of initial cluster conditions for comparison to observational data. Um, but, but by comparing to observational data, we can actually work backwards to constrain the initial conditions in dense stellar environments. And so how does this work? So just one quick example comes from the fact that our method can predict the peak density a cluster should reach during core collapse. So this is just because as star clusters evolve, heat flows from the core to the halo, causing the core to contract. The core is a negative heat capacity system. So this contraction heats it up further and it's a runaway process called the gravel thermal instability. The contraction should continue indefinitely, but what stops it are single binary interactions because on average, the ejected single leaves with more kinetic energy post interaction, providing a heat source. So with our model, we can compute the exact point and the corresponding peak density at which the rate of energy flow out of the core due to two body relaxation exactly balances the rate of energy flow into the core from single binary interactions. And if you just look at a particular post core collapse cluster and measure the peak density, this immediately informs you about the underlying binary population. Since for example, if you see very high central densities are reach, then this could suggest that the could suggest low binary fractions since there are apparently too few binaries to supply the needed heat source to bounce out of core collapse before reaching such a high density state. Um, and I'll skip, you, you get the idea that chaos and initial conditions are two problems that we need to overcome. And so before concluding, I'd just like to quickly advertise our recent textbook called Moving Planets Around. So please check it out if you're teaching or interested in celestial mechanics and designing versatile software environments for use in astrophysics-based research. Our focus is on exoplanet systems and teaching undergraduate and graduate students how to get directly involved in and contribute to peer review level research and computational